Hello, hello and welcome. Um, you are watching um, today's Journey for the Book Club live event um, and we have got a really exciting author to speak to today. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Journey for the Book Club is a community of nearly 1500 readers who work as CEOs, founders, marketers and all around ambitious people at some of the UK's most exciting businesses. So as busy, ambitious people, we know that it can be really difficult to prioritize time for learning and self-development and just solving the problems that weigh us down on the day-to-day. -day. So we serve as an antidote to the waves of content that are out there by providing weekly bite-sized insights from the best business and marketing books, hosting exclusive events just like this one where you get to hear straight from the horse's mouth on um, the newest theories and learnings. And most of all, we make space for discussion um, amongst the bright minds in our community to ensure that our reading and our learning turns into action and together we move our industries forward. So if you're not already a member, please do sign up. Um, we'll be dropping a link in the chat during this conversation. Um, and so I guess onto the the important bit and the reason why you're watching today. Um, I'm super excited to share um, that today's guest is a speaker a best-selling author and the host of the popular podcast, What's Essential. Um, I do believe he very recently interviewed Matthew McConaughey, so I'm sure we'd all love to hear more about that. Um, and he's been covered by the New York Times and Fast Company, and he's among the most popular bloggers um, for LinkedIn. He's also a young global leader for the World Economic Forum, and his best-selling book, and I would wager the reason that many of you are here, Essentialism, the Disciplined Pursuit of Less, has sold more than a million copies worldwide. Um, he is originally a Londoner, but I believe he's tuning in today from California. Um, and as he writes in his latest book, Essentialism was about doing the right things, um, but this new book, Effortless, is about doing them in the right way. So I'd love to welcome uh, Mr. Greg McKeon to talk about exactly that. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you as well. Amazing. Um, and are you? Is it sunny today in California? <laughs> I'm afraid it is. I don't mean to be uh, <laughs> <laughs> to I'm rub it in <laughs> about that, but uh, but yes, it's it's a beautiful day outside. We're just north of Malibu, and uh, but it's so nice to to be with you and to be with everybody. Uh, it's such an interesting last sixteen months, and uh, we we all had to adapt and, and navigate things. But I think it's been a bit of a challenge all around. Absolutely. And obviously your book has come, and we're going to talk so much about the book, but it's come yeah. at such an important time. Um, and yeah, well, I guess let's dive right into it. The book is, um, I've got my copy right here. Oh, I like that. <laughs> a bit of a plug. The book is um, subtitled, um, How to Make It Easier to Do What Matters Most. Mm. So I'd love to know what happened, you know, what's been going on in your life that's led you to ask this question and go on to research the answer and, and I guess, finally create Effortless. Mm. Well, I was trying to apply essentialism to my own life and... Um, and in some ways, successfully, I mean, I'm stripping away more and more non-essentials. I'm saying no to things that, uh, that that were good, but not the very best and highest use of me. I wasn't writing another book, for example. I was not doing a, uh, a workshop business. I put on hold a class I was I'd co-created at Stanford. And yet with all of that, I still felt like, yeah, but there's still too much. Uh, and so that challenge was already you know had my attention uh and I mean, i'm sure many people listening or watching this have, have heard the metaphor of the big rocks right the big rocks theory says if you put in uh the big rocks first and then the small rocks and then the sand then it all fits but if you get the order wrong if you put in the small the sand and then the small rocks and then the big rocks it doesn't fit and that's how that theory is supposed to work. I mean, that's basically essentialism is saying uh, if you put in, you know, look after your health and then you look after your most important relationships and then you look after your most important projects, then it all works. And, and I just found myself with a question, which was, yeah, but what if you have too many big rocks? Um, you know, what do you do then? And in the midst of already struggling with that, um, suddenly have a family crisis, um, the uh, really unexpected uh, 
complex neurological health condition comes up for one of my daughters, uh, for Eve. She's 14 at the time. She's gone from the picture of health suddenly to just having what is an undiagnosed um, neurological condition that just changes personality, removes a personality, uh, makes her go super slow in everything, and the, the neurologists don't know what to do about it. And so that then pushes this all over the edge because you say, well, what do you do under this circumstance? Do you, do you put away the essentials? Do you just say, well, one of these things doesn't matter. Many of these essentials, you just drop them. Um, do, you, do you try and just do them all in the way you were before? And then you burn yourself out and maybe still don't achieve the things that matter most. Um, those seemed like the two options at first. And then there seemed like there was this third alternative that, that we needed to learn ourselves in my life in our family uh, but then you know it has grown now uh, into research and trying to understand well that what if there's a, an easier way to do it um, and so so let me just state it this way I wrote the book not because life is easy but or that I think it should be but that life is hard in a hundred ways business is hard being an entrepreneur is hard growing a business can be hard I mean, everything can be hard in a variety of ways. And the complication is that in addition to things being a challenge, we often make them harder than they need to be. And if we do that, we'll burn out and still not achieve the essential results we care about. So my position in the book is we can make a different choice uh, that we can look for, at least learn how to look for a more effortless path. And that as we do that, we can actually find a way to break through to the next level of results, but without burning out. And so that's really sort of my my driver in, in writing the book. And, you know, I'm sure that is, the, when you first wrote Essentialism, this wasn't a position that you probably imagined being in um, for all number of reasons. Um, and I wonder how it felt for you to have written this best-selling book that so many people have adopted uh, the mindset and it, you know it's made a huge difference to many people's way of working and thinking mm -hmm. how did it feel when you start to go hold on I'm I'm doing what I've written I'm doing you know I'm living by what <laughs> by what I preach yeah and something's not and it's and, and and it's still too much how did that feel for you well I think it took me I mean I think I was very open to to more to learning uh, you know, the next set of lessons. You know, the way I see it now, essentialism in one word is prioritization. And I still believe that. I mean, that's still vitally important by definition. But I see if you had to summarize effortless in one word, it's simplification. And so I recognize now there's just, you know, essentialism is necessary, but insufficient. There's this other gear that is necessary and really advantageous. If you can simplify, if you can get rid of, let's say, uh, the overthinking, uh, uh, if we can get rid of the perfectionism, um, and if we can get rid of just other complexities that are, that are unhelpful, unnecessary complexities, then it's, it's, uh, it's not just that we can avoid the downsides of burnout, which I think is so relevant right now, but we can also enable us to do really remarkable things, things that currently seem impossible to us that can become, uh, you know, at first, you know, plausible, then possible, then doable, then they actually get done. And so I see there's like two messages within Effortless. One is if you're feeling burned out, which a lot of us are, uh, then it's helpful. And if you, if, if that isn't really your challenge, but you want to achieve something more, but it feels overwhelming to get there, Effortless can help with both scenarios. And so I think there's two value propositions depending on where someone is at the time of reading it. Absolutely. And and as you say, how could we not talk about burnout? Um, it is, you know, the predominant reason, uh, you know, why many people will be watching this. And it's something that I would wager that most people have experienced over the last however many months this has been going on for. I lose count. Um, but can, can I just riff on that with you for a second? Yeah. Because I, I think there's two kinds of people in the world right now. There are people who are burned out, and then there are people who know they are burned out. Yeah. Uh, like, that's that's it. And so what we want to get to, actually, is in the second category where we admit it. And one of the interesting pieces of research I came across in writing Effortless was that 
as people approach burnout, they actually become um, worse at detecting it. Yeah. So this is one of the things that drives people into burnout and then through it is because they don't see it happening. And so if you don't see it happening, you know, like if you're in denial or just unaware of something, you aren't going to change. And so sometimes people, maybe they sense things aren't, they aren't getting the results they want, but then they think, well, I must not be pushing hard enough. I need to push harder. And they start to get into forcing it. And that's the thing. When people get into forcing it, they start to break themselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. They start to break their relationships. Uh, they're ru ruining these relationships, even though their motives are to try and improve it all. And they can damage, you know, work relationships and work goals as well. And so, so just actually admitting and having enough insight and self-awareness, oh, I think I'm burned out, is really quite an important breakthrough because then you start to see, oh, the effortless is relevant. Well, I need to learn a new way of doing because I can't just keep grinding through the next 16 months the way I have the last 16 months. Absolutely. And and as you say, it can sometimes be incredibly hard to see that for yourself, like you to, to look at your own actions and have that self-awareness. But we can regularly see it in other people when we can see people going too fast and kind of going in any direction because they feel like it's for, you know, it, it's it's some movement at least. Um, and so you write in the book about, um, and again, I think it's something that all of us have felt, which is when you're so overwhelmed that you kind of lose capacity to think um mm -hmm. you know you lose the capacity that you're most in need of at that moment to try and you know m manage the many things you've got going on and so in effortless then to dig into a bit of the detail you call the opposite of this the effortless state um mm. i wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about that and how and why we can achieve that so the, the model that grew out of this research is has three concentric circles. At the center is what you've just said, effortless state. And we can talk about what it is. But first, what it leads to is the ability to start having effortless action. And then that enables us to be able to get effortless results. And so that relationship between the state you're in, the action you take, and the results you experience is an important relationship. Um, some people think, well, if I have the results that I want, then I'll, then I'll feel it, you know, then I'll feel good. Then I'll be able to relax. Then I'll, and it's actually the other way around. So inside out, um, you know, model effortless state is a state that most of us have experienced, but just not very often. It's when we're, uh, mentally at ease, uh, we're physically well rested, we're emotionally at peace. And so we just are at ease. You know, we can focus on what is most important without forcing it. We're just present and, um, you know, it, it's you can see it in high-performing athletes, right? They're about to take the penalty kick, they take a moment, they're pausing. Why? Why pause? What's the advantage? You pause because you get into this moment. You know that if you can get in the right state, you're more likely to be relaxed in your execution more likely to get the result that you want get the get the goal that you're looking for and so that relationship is is so vital in our lives if you can get back into an effortless state if you can then then you'll tend to produce far better outcomes and results in your life and for a lot of overachievers what happens is that they've been rewarded for working hard for pushing for challenging for sacrificing and so then as they start to get towards burnout, they go, well, I need to double down. And, and now they move into, uh, let's say, um, you know, diminishing returns, mm. and maybe even negative returns, where for every ounce of extra effort they put in, they're actually making everything worse. And so just backing up, I just had a, an entrepreneur just text me just yesterday, successful business. And he'd started reading Effortless and he just said, Greg, I, well, I mean, literally what he said is, wow, um, I didn't know how much I needed this. Mm. He, 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 he and his whole team had moved into a certain way of being that he hadn't noticed the shift. And so reading the book helped him to go, oh, my goodness, we've got to start having fun again. We've got to get back into a state of look, that this is going to everything's going to be all right. We're going to work this out together. And then if you get in the right state, 
that produces a lot of these other outcomes that you want. That's the effortless state. And as you say, you know, and you write in the book and it really hit home with me is like, we have this idea that something worth achieving and, and worth doing has to be hard. You know, yes. it's this kind of like, oh, you know, you really, you've got to put in the hours, you've got to put in the blood, sweat and tears. And only then, you know, will you achieve this, whatever it may be. But it, but it takes away from so much of why you probably want to do something, which is probably because at some point you had a love for it or because you had, you know, you had fun whilst doing it. But we just get so focused in the, on this grind and hustle, you know, mentality that we lose that. I was working with a manager at a university at uh, Brigham Young University, and she is the sort of person that will be up till four in the morning photoshopping uh, for the, the youth activity at her church the next day. And no one's asking her to do that, mm. but that's just that's what she thinks she's supposed to do. Uh, her mindset is one where if she even eats lunch, she feels like she's being selfish. Uh, if she's not exhausted, she's not doing enough. And so, I mean, I can look at that and we can all look at it from the outside and go, well, that's not going to produce breakthrough mm. results. You are just going to get more and more burned out and make sacrifices that are unnecessary and aren't actually helping, you know, the causes that you want to give your life to. And so one of the small interrupts, but a powerful one, is to invert the question. Instead of saying, well, how can I work harder to get better results? You say, look, how can we make this effortless? That is a huge shift. If you can change the question, you change the answers. And so she, I, I said, look, next time someone asks you to do something, just ask the question, how can this be effortless? And a professor the next day, whenever says, look, I want you to come and get your videography team to come and record our, you know, the semester uh for, for my class and she just jumps right in and mentally she is just preparing the whole thing we'll get my whole team there we'll have multiple angles on the uh, you know you know video angles we're going to edit everything we'll get music we'll get graphics we'll have intros outros we're going to wow him i'm going to wow him he's going to love us this is all like in her head this is all just you know burden no one is asking her to do any of that but that's what she thinks is being asked, or she just goes into that mindset. And then she remembers, okay, how can it be effortless? How could this be easier? And so she spends a couple of minutes talking with him, discovering, and, dis and they find that if this is just for one student, and one student is going to be an, athle an, a an athletic commitment on a few of the classes, so won't be there for all of them. And they come up with a solution that another student will just video it on their phone and send it to the student whenever he's going to miss. The professor's delighted. He too hadn't seen that there was a really easy path to solving yeah. this problem. She gets off the phone 10 minutes. She's had 10 minutes with him instead of four months for a whole team. And it was one of those big breakthrough moments where she discovered if you can ask a better question, if you can ask an effortless question, you might find an effortless strategy that was hidden from you before. Absolutely. And, and how amazing to look at that in hindsight, uh, you know, of what the energy and time that was saved to focus on something else. Well, that's exactly it, is, is that you, you're saving resources that you can now work on something else that's essential. But, but your point, and, I, and I'm riffing again, but this point about the, the more important a thing is, the harder it has to be. Those combining of those two ideas is something I noticed as I was on this sort of unparalleled listening tour for years and continue to be uh, for people that read essentialism and are, are impacted by it. It is routinely the case that people believe if they want to do the essential stuff, they simply have to work harder. Of course, sometimes that's true. If I'm doing nothing, if I want to exercise and I'm doing nothing about my exercise, then of course, if I put a little effort into it, I could get a better result. I believe that. That's self-evident. However, the belief that, for example, exercise has to take enormous effort, has to be, you know, it's got to be tough, it's got to be unpleasant, it's got to be a chore, that keeps a lot of people back from even beginning. They don't even start because they're so burdened by how hard it has to be and, and how miserable it is. And, 
and 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 so to just discover well what what might an, an easier path be uh, with my children for example we've just we've taken up swimming again because I love swimming and I like doing it with them and we've turned it into a fun thing and that's something we can do is is instead of thinking about essentials as a chore and even instead of thinking of them as well let's create a habit I'm in favor of habits but a habit tends to be something you do for some future reward instead you can come into a third category and create a ritual a ritual is a habit with a soul <laughs> a ritual is something that you enjoy in and of itself it's not what you do that's the habit it's how you do it and you can use a lot of creativity to create a ritual around something that's essential so it's no longer a chore and it's no longer a, just a habit a thing you do repeatedly but something you look forward to doing and once you get there the magic happens because now it's rewarding in and of itself uh, just even doing cleanup after dinner for us was like that it was a disaster before uh you know dinner would go all right we do dinner together most of the time and we had all sorts of rituals there we would we toast each other's successes through the day we'd laugh a lot tell stories I and mean, it was like we look forward to doing it but afterwards the cleanup was just pure chore and my children would just like always run off they'd be gone like ninjas they just silently you know disappear and one I, by one I, sneak yes, out the door I mean, you'd look around you'd be like when did they even leave i never heard <laughs> a word of it they just knew how to just, you know and and so and then i'm like cat and mouse is pulling them back and it's unpleasant for everyone and so uh you know we we went through a process to say well how can we make it easier divided at roles and responsibilities gave minimum standards you know like what does it look like to wipe down the surface what does it look like to sweep and be done with it took a bit of training and we thought okay this is it and it wasn't it at all the second the next day we tried nothing was different they were all gone oh, no. <laughs> like a, like a ninjas again they were back in full force and it wasn't until my daughter added a feature it's not not profound but she just added like karaoke music loud that like as soon as you put that on someone will start singing to it. You just basically can't not. And our family culture was such that as soon as someone was singing, someone else was. And then it's like, it became a little bit of a party. And, and it's it's become now a ritual for us. I'm not saying that everyone needs that same ritual. Maybe that approach won't work for somebody else. But it's an example of designing something that used to be a chore. We tried to make it a habit. Yes, that's some progress. But it wasn't until it became a ritual that suddenly... It's a it's now an enriching part of your life, uh, and it's you know it's the same level of importance as before, but the experience is so much better. And I guess, as you say, this the the ritual doesn't have to be the same for us, for everyone. But for some people, it could be that they don't have to listen to karaoke music if they do the washing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in the karaoke camp, that's for sure. Well, that's and what maybe, it is. It's about creating something that, that that makes the thing itself more enjoyable. And, yeah. and for the people that are running businesses now, I mean, we know this, but maybe over the last few months with all the extra stresses, you forget about it and you become all business. But like the culture is the most important thing. The state you're in personally, in your family and in your business, this is the most important thing because that's out of that state, out of that culture, great things get created and it makes everything else that you're trying to do easier. And if you get it wrong, if you just become all about the execution, results, results, work harder, work harder, you're burning up the culture. And so actually you're making it harder and harder to get the breakthrough results you want. Amazing. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, uh, yeah, if there's anybody who's listening who would like to ask Greg a question, um, please do drop um, your question in the comments um, and we'll come back to that. I've got two more questions for you and then I'll give you over to somebody else. Um, so Greg, so you're you're in this effortless state. You've you're you're finding fun. You're 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 making rituals out of the things that are essential. Um, you've prioritized and you've simplified your priorities. Mm -hmm. How do we then spin that out longer term? You talk about two types of results: linear results and residual results. Can you explain the difference between these and and why we should be striving for residual results in in kind of our day to day life? Yeah, that third concentric circle, like the, the effortless results, this is a new gear. 
of, of, of how to produce effortless results. If you can put in a small increment of effort, but get rewarded many, many times over, you have a residual result. A linear result is that if you put effort in once, you get result once. If you stop the effort, the result will end immediately. And for, for lots of us, we live our lives in linear effort and results. And so we keep learning that lesson that gets ingrained and that becomes a, a, a dominant paradigm. Well, you've just got to keep doing more. If you want more results, of course, by definition, you have to do more and more effort to get those results. As soon as you can break through that thinking and say, well, what if we could produce residual results? What are things we could do where we pay once or invest once, but get paid again and again and again? Writing essentialism was a residual result. You put mm -hmm. the effort in once, but now it's not just financial benefits. What I, what I love the most is the impact, residual impact. The people all over the world are still every day reading this book. I mean, I'm not writing it again. I don't write it a million times. You write it once and, and somehow the results keep coming and people, oh, I just discovered it. This impacted me in this way. I mean, how rewarding is that? I mean, literally yeah. the test is, I mean, if I, if, if I die tomorrow, the impact actually continues. That's so exciting to me, so liberating. And so the same way in our businesses, this, so this is the whole final section of the book, the third of the book is, is perfect for entrepreneurs, perfect for business leaders so that you start assessing every time you're doing an activity, you just at least start to look, is there a way that I can change the way I'm doing this so that I'll do this once, but the results will happen again and again for me. Uh, you know, an example, a concrete example for me of this is just making sure that you hire the right people, hire high trust people. When the trust is high in someone, everything is easier. When the low, trust is low in someone, everything is harder. And if you can find the right person, and I can give great criteria for this from Warren Buffett, he says, integrity, intelligence, and initiative, the three I's. Someone who's high integrity, you don't have to monitor them whether they'll do the right thing or not. That's internal for them. They're going to do what's right. Uh, if you, intelligence, they can figure things out. You don't have to explain it five times. They get it, high get it factor. And then initiative is that they are doing the thinking for you, that they aren't coming to you with problems without solutions. They're anticipating. Those three things, if you can, instead of throwing a person at the problem, oh, I just need someone in there urgently, put someone in, you actually pause until you can find someone with the three eyes. Your life, and that's one investment, maybe a little more investment than just throwing someone at the problem, but you put that investment in and you'll have 100 results flowing to you because you've got the right person in there. That's a good example for how to apply you know, this residual results mindset to a business. And how could anyone argue that taking the extra time to hire the right person who fits the criteria for that specific job and then the values more generally, how could you argue that that is not a beneficial use of your time? Yeah, well, that, that's what it is. And, and then once you have them on board, uh, it's important also to have a high, a high trust agreement. So you have the person that you do trust, but then make sure that you don't then limit them by having a low trust agreement. A low trust agreement isn't, no one sits around, hey, let's create a low trust agreement. But we sometimes create a low trust agreement by default. We make it unclear what results we want from them. We make it unclear what rules of the road there might be of things that would violate our uh, you know, our values so that we, we don't get clear about it. And so I recommend sort of these, we had three I's, these are the five R's. You just get clear with people about the results, the rules, uh, the resources. Um, uh, the, 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 and I think I'm missing one here, but the, and then the, uh, and then the rewards, like what's the outcome uh, that, that you need and, oh yeah, I'm missing the roles so that you really know who's doing what. And anyway, that's a, a chapter in the book specifically about these, you know, how to create a high trust agreement. But if you do those two things, you hire a high trust person, you set up a clear agreement together. Yeah, there's a little more investment there, uh, but it, but that will work in your favor again and again. And if you don't, think of the cost every single day. You you have to monitor them. You don't really trust them. They don't feel trusted. That's frustrating. The trust keeps going lower. Everything's hard. 
It's like what happens in an engine where the uh, you know your oil is going lower and lower. You don't notice it at first, but finally, just all the parts in the engine are grinding against each other. You can't make progress. Eventually, it can quit altogether if the oil gets low enough. Trust is like engine oil. Uh, if you can keep it high, then everything flows, everything smooth. Uh, and I think the two ways I've suggested are the most important things. Hire the right person, high trust person, give a clear agreement that they can then really flourish and do great work without you monitoring and, and, and managing them all the time. And beyond people, you share examples in the book of how we can do this, but with objects and things that we encounter in our daily lives as well. And I think as a person who probably is always living on the fly, kind of mm. deal, tackling problems as and when I just find them and then not really solving them and just <laughs> putting a plaster over the top. Um, I, I really think that this idea, and I think um, it was Dan Heath who wrote the book Upstream, yes. where, we, where we look at these ideas of tackling the problems upstream. And you deal with this in the book as well of how the time invested up front is always worth the the cost of the residual kind of firefighting that you would have to do if you don't don't do it properly i'm a big fan of upstream and i was talking with dan about it and uh, and in fact asked him the question like well how does this apply to the individual that's what i was so fascinated with and i liked the answers that he gave to me uh, but i also wanted to go further because i think that i think that the idea isn't just for policy makers um it can be it can be for for, for just in a very practical everyday you know, world, uh, if you can anticipate a problem, solve it before it happens, what else are you getting but a residual result? You know, one time or an investment up front and you solve a thousand problems down the road, you might not get a you know, hero reward for it. it. Might not be a big award, it might not be a statue because it's hard to, sometimes it can be hard to praise people that solve problems before they happen. Uh, but nevertheless, you just make this incredible impact. Uh, I mean, just just thinking, at least a s small story, a silly story, but of of a leader who um, opens their desk drawer, uh, and they, they, it takes them like two minutes to close it because they've got this thing in the way, and they're jiggling it around and messing with it, and they close it. And they have a mentor, Dean Dean Acheson, is watching this, and he says, "Hold on." He says, uh, can we just talk about that, the draw? Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And, and and the person's like, oh, what do you mean? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a hassle that this thing is here. And, and he said, well, could we just take literally two minutes? Let's time it, two minutes to solve that problem. And so they do it. They, like, just move the draw around and they fix the problem so it doesn't happen anymore. And the, the business leader just looks at Dean and he's just like, okay, that's worth your entire consulting fee. He said, I have messed with that drawer. I have done that every single day for two years. And Dean's like, okay, two minutes for two years. And that's the power of prevention. So prevention is like residual results, but like it's sort of an upside down way of looking at it. You're doing, you're putting in one time effort to solve a problem many times over in the future. Uh, and, and all you have to do is look for things that are irritating that you've been dealing with many times and just say, well, how could I solve this in a couple of minutes? What would that look like? Uh, and sometimes you can't solve problems in two minutes, but sometimes you can. And by asking that question, you find the answer. Another trivial example, maybe, but I was looking around my office one day and I saw, a, I, I was trying to tidy it up and I see that there's a, a, there's a printer. We'd replaced the printer. This printer worked fine, but just was printed really slow. The ink was a little more expensive and we'd, we'd replaced it with one we liked better. But then what to do with this? And so for two weeks, I just keep looking at it. Every time I look at it, oh, you know, what am I going to do? Do I give it away? Do I sell it? Do I throw it away? Where do I recycle it? And that thought process was enough. I said, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And then finally, I think, well, hold on. If I can solve this like one time, then that's it. It's gone. I don't have to keep processing it again and again, all those additive moments. What Maybe I could sit there for six months. Sometimes these things do. Sometimes... I did a piece of work. I know I'm now riffing on this story. I haven't finished this one, but I just did a piece. I did a piece of work with Steve Harvey, uh, and uh, on his show, we went to one of his um, his viewers' homes, and there was a Christmas tree up. This was like, I don't know. This might have been close <laughs> to November. This is the year after. 
she's had this tree up for a year and a half. It just never took it down. I and actually so have a neighbor who I can see. I look out of my kitchen window <laughs> and I can see their balcony and they have got not this year's Christmas tree stump, but last year's Christmas tree stump. And me and my flatmates are regularly, we've got a bet going on when it will get removed. So I can well, feel the, this deeply. <laughs> that's the thing you see. And and that's just a metaphor for us. And we include the story of the, of the printer before I forget that part. So I just say, okay, how can I solve this in like two minutes? What might be an effortless way of solving it? And I look up and there's some workers over the road and I thought, maybe they want it. So I go over there, do you want it? They want it, give it to them. Within two minutes of asking the question, the problem is not just potentially solved, it's actually executed, it's done. And that's it, I don't have to look at it anymore. That problem is out of my mind. That, that you, my, you know, every day, forever afterwards, I don't have to think about that anymore. And so even these little two minute interventions, these two minute preventions uh, for just, Everyday things, they don't seem like in themselves massive, but they, they bother us, they irritate us, they make life a little harder than it needs to be. And as you start to clear them off one by one, you just have a, you know, life is less burdened. You're taking out the rock from your backpack that, you know, from your rucksack that's this burdening you and, and, and life is a little lighter. And every day is a little lighter after that. And so it's, uh, to me, effortless is helpful in just being able to make things a little bit easier today and a little bit easier to tom uh, tomorrow. And so that's everybody's challenge for, you know, in the UK, Tuesday evening, have a look around your house. Where, what is that one thing that's been bugging you that you've been meaning to sort out, that bill you've been meaning to pay, the lawnmower, the duster that you need to sort out? And, and just see if you can remove that from your daily cycle of, of things to tackle. Um, Greg, I have to ask you before you jump off. Um, so obviously, um, we are speaking today for the Journey Further Book Club. So if you could recommend just one book to the members of the book club community, what would it be and why? Um, one that I'd recommend is Boys in the Boat. Um, I, I love it for... I love it. One, one reason I love it is because it feels like it captures a story that's both essentialist in nature and also effortless. It's really interesting. I mean, the, the premise, I won't give the giveaway, but the, the premise is that the, these, these boys in Seattle, they don't really have any money. Uh, they're not from like an elite school or something who used to dominate rowing. Uh, they're not Oxford, Cambridge. They're not, you know, they're just these, these boys and they get really focused on this goal of eventually going to the Olympic Games. And that it's a, it's a story, as I say, of focus, of passion, of interest. But there is also a surprising message around just not forcing it and actually quite an effortless story. I mean, there, there, there are times when they're, they're challenged. They're, doing, they're, they're in the boat. They've got university they've got jobs because they don't have any money but you don't get a sense of them just being stressed out all the time as we often are in modern times and then th there are times in the boat itself when they they move into swing where it's just this flowing effortless experience this is actually the ideal is where like this is how the peak performances that they uh, go on to experience happen is when they are just in this swing together and they're not, no one's forcing anything smooth. So to me, it's a beautiful story and illustration of, of how these two ideas come together. Uh, I think that, that, that you could read essentialism or effortless separately, but together I think they make uh, a more valuable thing and Boys in the Boat is a good illustration of that. Amazing. I haven't read that one, so I'll be I'll be firmly add, adding it to my list. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Greg. Um, and I'm sure everybody is now motivated to go and pick up a copy of Effortless. But if you haven't got one already, you can get one from um, all of the major uh, booksellers in the UK. You can go into physical bookshops to get one, which is super exciting. Yes. It's the best thing. It's, it's yeah, um, a, a real joy. And you can also catch Greg, um, I believe you're on all, or most of the social media channels. Um, and I've been watching some of the Instagram lives you've been doing. So do check out um, some of those other events that Greg is doing as well. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Greg. Um, and we'll catch you again next time.